so we've got a um, yeah, quite a full agenda. Are we going to be hearing about the uh, women's HLP advocacy animations? Um, we've got a presentation from uh, colleagues in El Salvador and Honduras on an HLP assessment there. An update from the AOR, which will be uh, looking at the work plan that we have for this year and next year and some uh, initial su suggestions around that to have a discussion um, and then um, a brief uh, update on the, the Global Protection Cluster Conference or forum happening in May. Then uh, an update from our colleagues in the shelter and CCCM uh, clusters who are working with them. I'm going to br a brief update on the visit to Somalia and then open it up for updates from colleagues uh, who are on the call as well. So um, that's what we're looking at doing. I'll, I'll put that in the chat actually, just so we can all have a, a look at it. Um, but yeah, I think so first uh, on the agenda will be to hand over to um, Eleonora, who's going to um, yeah introduce the, uh, the advocacy animations on women's HLP and uh, uh, talk us through those. Eleonora, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, so yes, today I will present to you um, the new release of the advocacy anim uh, animations on uh, women, land and peace. Um, this, um, this video, video animation has, is based on the key messages on women, land and peace that were published uh, last year and that have been developed uh, together with the HLP AOR, NRC, UNHCR. Um, and um, they've been the idea behind this uh, this animation is to was to uh, develop um, a simple and um, easy to use uh, tool to convey the the key messages. Um, so it's a sensit sensitization tool. Uh, it provides an overview on the importance of protecting women, land and property rights for women empowerment, for sustainable development, peace and stability, and um, it was uh, designed together with um, with the help of uh, graphic designers and with colleagues. It was first uh, presented during um, two HLP training sessions that were held uh, last year by UN Habitat together also with the HLP AOR, which allowed us to um, collect a feedback a bit on the on the style and also on the on the word it itself to make it as easy uh, to to understand as this is targeting um, a broad audience of uh, women and men uh, who are living in different contexts and who have different socioeconomic and cultural background as well as this different professional backgrounds and might have or not any knowledge uh, on uh, on on HLP so to the this uh, animation was launched uh, yesterday in the occasion of International Women Day but uh, it is not the only animation that has been prepared. Um, together with the advocacy, we also developed um, a training video. This training video, um, it, it provides a bit more comprehensive overview of the, of the messages, but it hasn't been released yet, and we plan to launch it during the um, Global Protection Conference in, uh, to be held in May. So I will uh, screen now the advocacy video. Uh, and uh, one more thing, this video is available in English, French and Arabic. I've put in the chat uh, the link uh, to the animations as well as, as uh, the messages. Uh, I will screen it now in, uh, in English, but for colleagues who prefer to watch it in different languages, please um, have a look because uh, they've all been uh, uploaded. Also, I, I try to understand how to screen with the audio. I hope I understood correctly. I will try now, let's see. <laughs> um, can you see my screen? Yes. yes, yes, we see it, yes. All right, then let's yeah. hope also that you will be able to hear it. Yes. When her husband is killed in armed conflict, Sara and her children flee their village to seek refuge. When she finally returns home, she finds her brother-in-law is trying to sell her house. He claims that as he is the sole male heir of his brother's estate, the property is now his. But Sara knows that she and her late husband had joint ownership of the house. She is afraid, but she is determined to regain access to her family home. 
she speaks to the traditional leaders who agree to organize a mediation meeting. The brother-in-law is made aware of Sarah's rights and is required to return the property. Thanks to the support of the community leaders, Sarah is not forced to go to court and so she is able to keep good relations with her husband's family. She can now focus on providing for her family and rebuilding her life. Women's rights to housing, land and property are central to peace. If women own and control their land and property, they will feel more secure. If women can make decisions about the land they cultivate, they are able to improve food production and everyone will have more to eat. If women are empowered, they will have a bigger say in their community and society. They can help find solutions to conflicts and violence is less likely to break out. Three things are vital. Laws and policies must allow women to own, rent and use land and housing. It is necessary to do away with discriminatory rules, give women equal rights to land and property, and issue joint ownership documents. Attitudes in society must change. It should become socially acceptable for women to own the land they cultivate. Community leaders should come to realize that this is not a threat, but would benefit everyone. They should become champions of empowerment. Women themselves should be empowered. That means education and awareness raising. Women should know their rights and be able to demand them. To learn more about the messages on women, land and peace, visit our website. One second. Okay. Uh, all right. Then, um, if um, the agenda allow, um, please, Chairman Umberto, confirm. I would like also if any of you has any reaction. Um, we would like, of course, suggestion for the dissemination of uh, these videos. So far, uh, they've been uh, disseminated through GLTN and uh, UN Habitat platform. They will be, of course, disseminated through uh, DHLPOR and Global Protection um, Cluster 1. Um, overall, in previous uh, meetings, uh, most of the respondents convened that social media is post probably the um, the, are, is the platform where this uh, this video is most suited to be shared, but we actually hope that uh, it can be featured in the website of um, other organizations that can be screened uh, during, for instance, uh, webinars, conferences, university courses. So I would be, of course, also very happy at any time to provide you with the um, with the file if it helps and if it's needed uh, for you to use offline. And um, yeah. Thank you for watching and if you have any feedback, um, we would really love to hear from you. Thanks, Eleonora. I see already um, something in the chat uh, from uh, Jasini um, in uh, northeast Nigeria. Uh, short, precise and carries a key message. So that's helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, anyone else wants to comment and, and particularly on that? Uh, suggestions, ideas around how we could um, share and push push this uh, animation and it, and its various languages as well. So um, yeah, if you have any ideas or thoughts, um, and the links are in the chat to access as well. Jim, so. uh, I mm. I just wanted to say that uh, you know the video is online. Uh, of course, uh, you know so anyone is is completely free to use it the way it is, and the other one, the bit longer one, will be as well. So feel free to to make use of it also with your donors or you know and and help us think through how to make better use of it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks and thanks for the comments. Um uh, yeah, and that idea, yeah, being able to use it ourselves, like you say, post take the, the link, use it where you would like. Um Joseph asking if it can be split into uh, social media platforms, uh, so put into smaller parts so you could push little bits of it out. I don't, that may be an option, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, and yeah, thank you. But yeah, have a, I think, anything else? Um, Eleanor, anything from you uh, to just to pull that together? Uh, 
Uh, well, now, first of all, thank you for the comments of colleagues and uh, on the length of the video for the advocacy videos. Um, we already consider a length that is uh, the length that is a, it's possible to share as it is on social media platform, including uh, Twitter, like if the, the platform will uh, will allow. And for the training video that will come out, since that will be a longer ver a longer video like around 10 minutes uh, we have uh, we have explored this option of um, making it shorter so that it can be used and uh, shared separately yeah yeah that's good thanks and I, and I see yeah Joseph your point that um, yeah sometimes we have a, a big push when something's released and then forget to keep sharing and I think that's true with a number of different resources that we, that we have we know are still good and still relevant um, and uh, we need to keep uh, being able to to yeah to share those, um, so yeah I I agree on that one. Great, thanks, Eleonora. And yes, please keep having a think about that and see what ideas uh, come up. And let's keep yeah re let's keep with our regular meetings. Keep saying, reminding ourselves about these animations and that they're there. Um, I think that's a good idea. Um, great, thank you for that. Um, now I'm going to move on to the next uh, item in the agenda, which is uh, to call on our colleague uh, Sylvia, uh, who's going to share about uh, HLP assessments in El Salvador and Honduras and give us an update on, on the work there. Uh, Sylvia, over to you. Let me just, I think I saw you online before, so. Yeah, yeah, hi, hi. Morning. Excellent. Morning for me. <laughs> yes, good morning. Uh, 7, 7 a.m. here. Ah. So. Thank Wait, you. Um, no problem. I'm going to share my screen. OK. Um, I guess you can see it. Yes, we see it well. Yeah. OK. Good. Um, Perfect. Sorry, one second. OK. Um, OK, so first of all, Maybe that, sorry, Sylvia. Just say now we see the your uh, mode where you can see the two uh, slides. Well, I don't really have many. Um, okay, wait. It was it was the one before you had it fine. Yeah. Okay. That's it because I don't have many notes beyond the. Oh well, it's fine then. It's okay. I don't know how to take it out now. No wait. Okay. Let me. Whatever. Um, so, so hi, well, I don't know if Jim said anything, but okay, first I'm going to introduce myself. I'm uh, Silvia and I'm the ECLA PDM, Program Development Manager for uh, uh, Central and uh, so Northern and Central America. Um, we, NRC has been working uh, in this region since 2016. And uh, it was mostly managed by by a big office in Colombia, and um, they've been trying to separate. Uh, so they they decided to separate the country offices um, more or less two years ago. Um, so maybe just to say that we cover Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and uh, the border between Guatemala and Mexico, so southern Mexico, from from this office. And uh, in terms of uh, well, in terms of e of ICLA, it's it's more or less a startup since they were not doing much, let's say before I arrived a year and a half ago. And definitely in terms of HLP, it's uh, I mean it's a definite start startup. Um, these uh, we conducted two assessments that the ones that I'm going to present a little bit. Um, one in Honduras and one in El Salvador in 2022. Uh, we finished both of them mid 2022, and uh, and these assessments were were aimed mainly, I mean, not only to contribute to the HCT, but also to give us an idea as ICLA on the land, the legal landscape, the actual landscape, and also the particular issues of uh, HLP in relation to displacement in uh, in this uh, in this particular area. Um, it's not focused on uh, on migration, but it's focused on, on on internal displacement, which, as some of you might know, is mostly based on uh, gang violence and uh, and and control of uh, 
um, what they call here by social violence. So it's mainly uh, Maras and Pandillas, so non-armed groups, but very much independent and uh, having a lot of power. Um, so maybe having said that, uh, just also another note I wanted to say uh, about these assessments that uh, they were carried out through an external consultancy and um, we we had the, the opportunity to work together with with Laura um, and uh, Laura Cunial and, and Juliet Sin. I guess Juliet is not in these meetings, but <laughs> but anyways, just just wanted to say that uh, they worked together with uh, with a little team that we had on board at the time and uh, with also a colleague from Colombia that came out to help with with all of the uh, data collection. Um, and uh, maybe yeah, one last point just to say that it was a very nice joint effort because we got all of the education team and shelter team to help us out and the community mobilizers because we we didn't have a lot of team at the time. Uh, so it was not carried out by ICLA staff, but it was carried out by, at least by community and sort of or semi uh, uh, NRC staff. Um, so I'm going to be presenting two. This is so I'll, I'll present them simultaneously. Um, and uh, so one is uh, the one for Honduras, which is called uh, No Worry Safe. And um, and the other one. Sorry, Annie. Uh, it's uh, I Want My Place, which is the one for for, for El Salvador. Um, I will touch upon because I don't have a lot of time. I will touch upon briefly on the methodology very, very briefly. A couple of lines on relevant institutions. I will not touch upon the legislation because we don't have time for that because it also goes through the agrarian reforms, but the um, the assessments are online, both in English and in Spanish. Uh, and um, and then I will mostly focus a little bit on the HLP issues that we that we um, yeah, that came out of the of the study. Uh, so methodology, just to let you know very quickly that we conducted around, uh, so we did a beyond the death review that the consultants did. There was a quantitative data uh, survey in each country. We reached nearly 800, uh, 800 households per country. So this one is for Honduras, uh, where we did it in three departments and uh, within nine communities. And then we also combine it with qualitative data with FGDs and interviews. In El Salvador, it was it, it was it was it was similar and also nearly 800 uh, households that were surveyed. And we did it in 17 communities uh, within five municipalities. I think it was also three, three, three departments. Um, the main limitations, just just to be aware, is as I said, well, there was no ICLA. Uh, the ICLA team had just been set up and we didn't have any presence in the field. So we depended on the presence of our uh, other CCs and also on humanitarian access. Um, this means um, our education team does operate in areas where gang violence is uh, present and controlling the areas, but still, even within these areas, uh, the community mobilizers know which areas they can go to, which ones they cannot go to. So still there was a bit of um, yeah, data collection could only be carried in safe areas as there is no, well, there's no negotiation on, on, on access, so to say. Uh, in So we could go maybe to one street, but maybe to the next one, no. It was to that level of detail. Um, and then, as it happens in many other countries, well, there is fear or reluctance to self-report as IDP. Uh, so we tried to put a couple of extra questions to let us know if they had been displaced or not. Um, here, um, well, displacement is not very, it doesn't have a lot of quantitative data on how many people are displaced and they're not up to date. There is something in Honduras, but not so much in El Salvador. and. And most people, they well, they, there's no laws. There, there are laws. Sorry, there is there, there is a law that is not even implemented in El Salvador, and there is a, a law that just was uh, approved end of 2022 in Honduras. So there's no many there's no services beyond humanitarian services for displaced people, and it's uh, and also because mostly it's it's like a hidden pattern of movement where they leave the house as fear of. Um, uh, being murdered or uh, um, being asked, you know, to pay 
uh, as fear of, uh, for extortion or maybe because they want to take on they want to kidnap the, the the daughter to marry her off and then they won't say that they've been displaced um they'll just say that there has there was a family issue or or maybe they're gonna add job opportunity because uh, they don't want them to be found again um so a little bit yeah um on well i touch upon a little bit on the legislation so there is one now on honduras and one in el salvador neither of them are being implemented and uh, if you want to know a bit more on the agrarian reforms or or the property legislation the the reports have that covered um just maybe to give you a hint on the relevant institutions so in honduras we have three relevant institutions that are um manage register land uh, and also property um the general property institute the agrarian institute and the municipalities um they are so they are not very well connected uh so the municipalities only register land for uh, for land uh and, and property for for tax purposes and they do not necessarily cross check with the agrarian institute and the property institute um the the system is not so uh so 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 developed that they can do that and in some cases it's very very primitive um so there is existence of uh, multiple land registries and cadastres with with conflicting information this is basically the the, the result um there is also another figure which is like a community figure uh which is called patronatos they don't officially have any role to play over land but since they administer the daily life of the communities and they advocate in front of the municipalities for services uh they end up in some cases doing some very informal land registry or keeping records of of who lives where uh, but this is not shared or recognized by, by the municipalities either, but at least it plays a little bit of a, of a role of the community knows. They also, in some cases, they do allocate land. We cover that a little bit, uh, even if it's informal. Um, now, in El Salvador, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more organized. Uh, we do, there is the municipalities, but, but they don't have any legal authority to grant land, uh, to, grant land uh, to title. And uh, the cadastres, um, um, they just serve to, to, to show who is registered uh, and who lives in the community. Uh, the tax purposes is very, very, they're, they're minimal in, in El Salvador. So that's, that's not so much of an issue as in, as in Honduras. And there is one figure, like national figure, so the National Registry Center, that uh, combines the property registry and the uh, agrarian registry as well and uh, everything needs to be registered or should be registered there. Um, and there is also the, the same figure as in, as in Honduras for uh, community self-organization, and um, they, um, which is called ADESCOS in this, in this, in this case. Um, I cannot translate for the name, but it's something related to the administration of water, but they actually administer the, the, the whole community. And the same, they don't have any official powers, but they do get involved in uh, um, in the land status of the community and the property status in the in the community in in the cases where they actually want to get uh, involved and in the cases where there is problems. A very informal, uh, but they do help us, at least now that we're in the communities to 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 get in and and, and know the landscape. Um, so HLP issues in these in these two countries. I will start with Honduras. Um, I'm not really sure, Jim, at what time. I, I know that you tell me 15, 20 minutes. I don't remember. I guess I'm 10. So you, you'll you cut me or, or give me a sign. OK, I will. I will, I will cut you I've off. And um, yeah, <laughs> okay. but no, no, please carry on for a few minutes and then it'd be nice to be able to have some uh, questions as well. So, yeah, thanks. OK. Um, so in terms of the issues, uh, so for Honduras, we so we found out uh, generally there is um, well there is tenure and security. Uh, this tenure and security is mostly related to the fact that uh, uh, following disaster, um, natural disaster, 
many communities moved uh, just to a new settlement, and it was where it wasn't uh, land wasn't was undeveloped and it was unoccupied. And uh, even they recognized themselves that they sort of invaded these uh, um, these places. Um, this has uh, most cases there is um, there is uh, an effort to regularize mostly from the community, but uh, the efforts um, have not achieved much, and uh, some of the communities have been in this process for uh, for several years. Uh, even since uh, one, uh, even decades, because even since Huracan Mitch in the 90s. Um, there is also um, confusion regarding uh, titling processes. As, uh, as I say, there, there is lack of information on the status. So regardless whether you have invaded or not a community, the, 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 the titling process is not very, um, uh, it's not very transparent. Um, there is a lot of information. There is a lack of information on the status. There is lack of follow up on the authorities of the status of the of the case, um, and uh, yeah, the cadastral offices uh, they are understaffed and uh, they are under resourced. So this discourages also new communities to get into this kind of uh, of, of processes. Um, there is incorrect, uh, well, and, and, it's, and it's, as, as in many other uh, places, trying to move. Okay. Uh, there is incorrect uh, land uh, lost, damaged documents, and uh, no registration records. In general, um, this varies from 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 community to community or from department to department. We've had departments like in the islands where there was a fire and everything was lost. Uh, we have other departments where it's just that uh, the documents are pretty much incorrect as they uh, do not match at all with what the uh, Institute of Property, the National Institute of Property uh, records state. Um, there is... Um, so in comparison with other countries, I would say that possibly, I mean, uh, it's, it's not so well, so badly recorded land and property um but there is uh, uh there is a general lack of update um in uh, of these registries so they may date to 20 years ago uh so they are still in the name of someone which is that, that someone is not the current owner or occupier and there is no trail on the ownership uh, um handing you know, being being handed over um, even within the same family, so we'll cover that. Um, many, so we, as as a result of our interviews, we got that 13% didn't uh, have informal documents, and that 36% don't have any at all. But that this gives us that still around 50% have documents. The thing is that among these documents, uh, like you could say that possibly 90% or 80% are not updated, so they have old documents. Uh, sorry, this is in Spanish because it's a photo, um, but um, this is the multiple types of ownership that they told us. So there is uh, there is a big chunk that they, they say that they have uh, public, so formal documentation. Uh, even, but no, this documentation might not be exactly in their name, but maybe in their grandfather's name. Uh, and there is still a fourth uh, that says uh, that they have some kind of other documentation community or receipts, uh, so some and, and any other or just a, a, a request for regularization, any other kind. Um, in terms of women LGP rights, um, it's, it's, it's fairly advanced as 93% uh, of the female responded that, uh, that they do have documents on their on their name alone. Uh, and 16% uh, said that they had uh, documents uh, in the name uh, together with someone else, either their husband or or or, or a brother. Um, inheritance. So one of the main issues that came up on uh, beyond the lack of updating the the the, the records um, was inheritance disputes. Um, this this comes from a tradition of. Uh, uh, several fam several member families living in the same land and uh, the father allocating property uh, while still alive. And uh, as I said, since property records are barely uh, updated, 
uh, inheritance is, is, is seldom legalized. And actually 60% of the people who inherited their homes say they had not legalized the, the inheritance divisions. And then this comes as an issue, uh, as you know, for, for, for family disputes and, and also when, there is, uh, when, when they have to flee as they don't have any documentation to then uh, either sell or, or, or lay or, uh, um, or uh, rent uh, the, the places. Um, a big issue also in, in Honduras uh, is the loss of property at the place of origin after displacement because of, um, because of violence. Uh, there are several issues here. Uh, one is that uh, guns may actually evict you to take control of the house. Uh, they may evict you just to take control of, the, of, of that corner, so not necessarily the house, but they will loot it. Uh, and uh, they will, in some cases, they will use it as their own, uh, what they call casas locas, so as their own, let's say, place to hang out and commit crimes. Uh, if you flee because of extortion, they might not do anything to the house uh, and you might be able to keep an eye on it through someone else, but still, I mean, gaining access or coming back is not foreseen until uh, the violence or, or the gang is out. Uh, so that's 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 very uh, difficult for, for families that are displaced. Um, and in, there was a government study done and it said that one third of, of the people that, uh, that uh, was displaced had ownership before and that um, only, uh, I think it was only 20%, can I remember now, uh, had actual documents. So the house uh, stays sort of in a in a limbo uh, as, as as most of them were not registered uh, before displacement um there is if you want to know a little bit more about uh, renting and uh, and issues about renting this was covered in the in the in the assessment but didn't have time to cover everything in in this presentation um then we have el salvador so el salvador oh, presentation yeah. Sylvia, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, just another minute, really, if, if that's OK. okay. Um, yeah, sorry. yeah, it is. Thanks. No problem. This one is a bit shorter. Uh, so maybe just for El Salvador to say that um, um, as in Honduras, there is lack of registration and an ability to access titling services, uh, even if uh, it's, it's similar problem. So even if uh, the World Bank in 1995 did a survey saying that 83 percent of the land had titles, um, it is it, it is commonly believed that these titles are not up to date, uh, even if there is only one registry and taxes for property registration are are not so 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 high. Um, there is a lot of uh, there, there is some processes that are still ongoing. So there is from the agrarian reforms, there is beneficiaries that don't have documents yet from. Uh, the agrarian reforms and also from reforms uh, after the, 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 the civil war in, in El Salvador. There is buyers that after the civil war were promised, were got well, into uh, an agreement that was done also through the government to buy property from land developers, but uh, still these titles have not come through because there is a lot of irregularities in this process and, on, and also on the actual land developers that were approved or even in some cases not approved by the government and uh, yeah, and there is there is a lot of lack of knowledge on how to navigate the legal system for women land ownership yeah, you can see it's a little bit like in in in, in Honduras so fairly recognized um, and the main issue again that it came out was uh, was also inheritance disputes as there is the same pattern of uh, um, living in the same uh, land and uh, and not not uh, not following through the inheritance process, not knowing the process, not knowing that you need a notary. This is a fairly sorry I forgot to mention, but this is a fairly legalized and notarized and uh, lawyer wise uh, system in general in 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 Central America, well in general in America. And therefore, you you do need to go through a mediation process. You like formally, you do need to go through notary for every document, and uh, and people don't know or they or they they don't have the means uh, to go through that. Um, I'll cover now. This one is okay. And just just the loss of property. Just just to say again what I mentioned. This is the last slide, Jim. Uh, this is the is the same problem as uh, as in uh, as in as in Honduras. 
uh, reg regarding uh, gang violence and the use of property and the loss of property and the impossibility to regain it afterwards. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. That was fascinating. Um, I want to open it up for questions or comments, or you may see parallels, similarities in your own work. Um, but yeah, please, uh, the floor is open for any questions or comments. We have a few moments to uh, ask Sylvia about this. Or feel free to write in the chat if you have a question as well. Yes, uh, Lorena, please come in. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. No, I just wanted to maybe maybe just uh, link this process that um, NRC has done with the information that was like gathered in the analysis of the legal frameworks uh, in Honduras. Um, let me just think it was in 2018. Um, and there were like specific issues also uh, connected to the process where we created a specific module within the Property Institute for the recording of abandoned houses due to forced displacement. So when I was there, I mean, we did the whole process of the identification of abandoned houses, but this information was included in one specific module uh, within the uh, unique registration system that the Institute, the Property Institute uh, has. Um, we uploaded about 1,500 properties at the time, but I, I'm talking about uh, 2020 now, so I don't really know what's the current status. Just to highlight that the findings that uh, NRC has done regarding the different levels of uh, ownership and documentation could be also useful if linked with the process of identification and registration on aband of abandoned houses due to force Displacement. So, just wanted to to flag that out because it could be useful to cross check that 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 process too. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. And I guess a, a point to Lorena and to um, Sylvia as well. If you would be able to share uh, links to those documents or anything relevant in the uh, in the chat, that would be great. Um, if you can't do it right now, send to me and we can make sure we get that shared. Um, I see a question in the chat uh, from uh, Ludmilla. Uh, regarding the high percentage of women who have titles in their own name, is there or was there any program that specifically favoured women for titling? Um, so given that women, you know, it was quite a high percentage of women who had titles in their own name, was there something specifically that favoured women uh, in the programming? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so for the links, uh, yeah, I will put them afterwards. And uh, Jim, you also have the links both in Spanish and English in a previous email, so you can also share them around in an email afterwards. Sure. Um, for the question on uh, women, uh, I mean, there was... Uh, oh, sorry, I was looking for the camera and I couldn't, just so at least you can... Um, there was a little bit of a tight... There, in El Salvador, it was as part of the agrarian reform and also after the efforts uh, after the civil war. Um, they favored uh, women uh, also because it was after the civil war and many men had either fled or, or, or were dead. Um, now, it was difficult to be honest because as far as we understood, I mean, information has been very difficult to gather because uh, many lands were on the name of the of, of, of men and then you needed to prove that you are a farmer which they couldn't prove it so that, that was on the agrarian reform on the rest to be honest it's actually it depends i mean we didn't get any any official <laughs> It, it, we didn't get any official uh, efforts in favor of women it was um I guess in some, I mean, we, we did have some informal communications and like the feedback from the beneficiaries themselves in some cases where I might as well have this in my in, in my in my uh, wife's name and they just didn't know that the others say that, that she was more. There is a tendency for men to leave women or to remarry and have several women um they they live out of nowhere the house so maybe for this so usually for the sake of the children 
they say, okay, I don't mind if it's even just in my in my wife's name because she will stay there and then the children will have a place to live. So it's a very curious and very different context um, than in other places. And uh, also maybe regarding what Wasa said uh, before, yes, I mean, we did a lot of interviews and this uh, work has been coordinated with, with UNHCR. Uh, it's not funded by UNHCR, but it, but we did have a lot of discussions. We meet, we met all of the all of the legal actors, so the properties, the municipalities. Uh, we do work together with them right now. It's just that, um, uh, yeah, that work was done a while ago uh, on the registration of the properties, and also, um, so it was only done for those that are actually registered in the property institute. Those that are not registered, then you cannot put a note to protect that property in the institute because they are not. Then uh, this was done for properties abandoned, but the actual owners had fled and the actual owners were not part of the process. So there may be properties protected in the official registry, but the owners might not know about it because this was done through community links. And as I said, most registries are not up to date, so that owner might never appear uh, just because it was, I don't know, it was the grandfather at the time. So it is um, now that the law has been approved in Honduras, we hope there might be a different or a speeded process as also the, the registries are not very, it's not such a big issue uh, here as in Guatemala, which I wanted to mention, by the way, that we're launching the same assessment in Guatemala, and uh, that one is going to be a whole different issue <laughs> with indigenous rights and uh, historic rights. So not uh, not so much related. I think it's going to bear different different uh, uh, findings. So hopefully we can also present that uh, in a couple of months to come. Great. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thanks for getting up early to join us. Um, thank you. And yeah, please keep if there's any questions that keep coming, put them in the chat and uh, Sylvia may be able to respond there or we can follow up afterwards. And if you have other pieces of work, colleagues that you're developing and would like to present them, please do let us know and we will look to um, uh, find a slot for you to do that. Because it's really great to be able to not only talk about you know, some of the, the ways we're communicating, but also get into a little bit of depth about some of the work we're doing as well. So thank you. Really appreciate that. I'm going to now just have a bit of a time sort of to focus on on the AOR, on the area of responsibility and uh, going to hand over to Ombretta, who's going to uh, lead us through um, yeah, a, a brief discussion looking at our sort of work plan for the this year and next year and, and some suggestions around that. Uh, it'd be great to get your comments and thoughts on that. Um, but yeah, Ombretta, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and uh, hello again, everyone. I hope you can see my screen correctly. Yes, we see yes. it well. Great. Um, great. So yeah, I'm presenting now uh, the, the common um, first draft of the work plan for the HLPAOR uh, is definitely a first draft for discussion. Um, we are looking at the 2023-2024 um, time frame, um, and it's based on um, some of the discussions we had with some of you, but also the results of the survey that uh, many of you did. So thank you very much for that. Um, and a little bit the sentiment is to focus on key strategic action that will lead to change, um, out of which then we can, uh, of course, increase and add as we feel uh, necessary as we go. Mm. We have identified uh, four, uh, six uh, key areas um, of work that the, the Global AOR um, can do, you know, we can do together. Uh, and um, one is the, the community of practice, so it's sharing the, the le learning, the lessons, the results of the assessments as, as we are doing also today. Uh, we are supporting the HLP intervention in, in country uh, operations. Uh, so facilitating or contributing or adding to the work on HLP that is done by country colleague uh, as we can, and this will vary from country to country. There is, uh, of course, the website uh, or, or the HLP part of the Protect Bigger GPC website, which is being worked on. 
Um, there is the advocacy effort, there are training and um, basically integrating uh, and giving visibility to HLP within broader actions. Um, so these are the key areas uh, and uh, I've indicated with some uh, asterisks those that um, uh, came up, up as, as key priorities also in the survey that, that, uh, that many of you did. So really needing, needing uh, you know, uh, scaling up training for country levels. Also, I mean, it's perceived as very good and important to have this space to share information and uh, advocacy and supporting country level. Uh, zooming in now in the different, uh, these six different topics, uh, with the community of practice, uh, we have the global meetings like these ones, uh, which have, uh, you know, a dif different type of components. Uh, there is an aspect, obviously, of coordination, information sharing, but we thought perhaps to also add dedicated thematic meetings that will focus on a specific topics and many of you um, uh, propose some of these topics. I'll, I'll share briefly some that emerge as priority later on, but definitely, you know, uh, let us know even today or later on if there are any ones that you would like to lead or that you'd like to hear more about. Um, there is also the newsletters uh, and uh, you know the, the online newsletter that is being sent out, which is very useful. Um, there are coordinator, uh, there are meetings for coordinators, uh, and then there is the participation and contribution to the global protection cluster annual meeting, like the one will take place in May. Uh, in terms of HLP country operation, um, there is the need of supporting uh, or we are looking at supporting a humanitarian program cycle, uh, which is an activity that is, is um, a need for many of, of colleagues at country level. Um, uh, sharing uh, information management pro products, uh, more sharing than developing, uh, but definitely key uh, key uh, collections of existing products can also be done as uh, was done in the past. Um, but uh, yeah, they are having this, this role of uh, uh, sharing what is there in terms of products and uh, making sure that products that exist can be found, uh, can be shared by those who produce them and can be found in our various platform, but of course, mainly the, the HLPOR, the Global Protection Cluster HLPOR platform. Um, mapping the HLP coordination, um, strengthening or continuing doing the, a function of help desk for country uh, offices, country colleagues and um, connect relevant actors at country level. Um, we, we received the feedback that this is uh, something that is very needed and that has worked well in some context and definitely will be really added value to the work that perhaps HLP class HLP actors do, uh, but could be better connected to, for example, shelter actors or other uh, actors. Um, Third, the website, uh, I think this is self-evident, uh, then the advocacy, so advocacy to be done through webinars and events, uh, also to support by supporting advocacy at the country level, uh, by raising the profile of HLP within you, uh, with humanitarian actors uh, like the protection cluster as a whole or, you know, dedicated organizations, um, also raise the profile of HLP across actors that might fall different, uh, you know, different places along the humanitarian development divide. Uh, so, uh, because particularly for country level, this is important where, you know, there might not be so many actors dealing with HLP per se, but maybe other actors that deal with land or housing uh, or land tenure security uh, broadly. Um, so you see some indicated there and this uh, also includes definitely the donors. Um, training. Training was, uh, I think, the most popular uh, area of, of uh, work that many of you identified, and this 
takes place in, diff in different ways. Some will, might be organized by the HLPORs, but we also noted, and many of you flagged, that you are already having uh, or planning to do training and capacity building in your own context. So it, I, uh, please do share this information with us so we can also connect additional stakeholders within the country of the context where you are planning this. And if needed, we can fill in some content or share some uh, information where we can. And then uh, integrating HLP uh, within uh, the work of other clusters, uh, with other AORs of the Global Protection Cluster, and within our other streams of work. Um, we also looked at other aspects, uh, which are, uh, you know, language inclusivity, you know, to, to attempt at least to to not make this an English only platform, but, uh, you know, bo bo boosting uh, our um, outreach to other, uh, uh, you know, um, to, to, to communities that speak other languages. I think Jim reported before as well that they are strengthening and are strengthening the the francophone uh, support, but we will try and to keep this in mind and make available, you know, things in different languages and try to host at least some of the discussion in other languages. Uh, looking at the governance of the AOR, uh, which, uh, you know, includes the strategy, but also possibly a strategically advisory group, probably this will be, you know, coming along when the, the revision of the GPC uh, governance is a uh, it's a bit more clear, uh, but we, we keep it there as something that we might have to discuss maybe when we meet face to face in May. Lastly, uh, you know, uh, I said briefly that we will touch, uh, we, we will try to make space for, you know, focus on some of the thematic areas that are re relevant with webinars or compiling, sharing materials, uh, looking at the results of what you said and the discussion we had, uh, the key five ones, that doesn't mean it's an exhaustive list, but many of you converged around these key areas, which is due diligence, for HLP, but also work on due diligence that is maybe done by shelter actors, for example, eviction prevention and response, women HLP rights, uh, HLP in durable solution, uh, intervention, local integration, resettlements, urban areas. So uh, making sure that basically um, all of us have a better understanding on what that means, so what are the options, what are the practices, what has worked or not. Uh, restitution and compensation and other and and, and there will be others but uh, you know we look at now maybe start starting to identify and slot some of this thematic discussion so do please uh, reach out to us and tell us if you would like to lead one if you have things to share if you want to have if you're doing work that can be then brought back and reported to the OR as a community as a whole um yeah that's that's it from uh, from my side um open uh, to you for comments inputs reflections questions uh. All right, I see um, there is a conference coming up in the US, so this is good. Um, see how we can, uh, you know, link back the, the, all these different pieces. Um, uh, and then training, so that's great. Um, maybe can I just, maybe, can I just um, say a few words about that? Yes, please. Oh, sorry, I saw yeah, sure. see there um, are some hands up. Go so, ahead. Yeah, his, historically there was a massive land conference hosted by the World Bank, which hasn't been happening uh, for I think the last three years. Um, we also see there's lots of different US stakeholders interested in land from different ways, um, many NGOs, but also obviously we want more people to be <laughs> to be doing land in uh, humanitarian post-crisis programming. So. The conference is kind of a first attempt to get probably semi, not really a very formal conference with submission of papers, but more of a series of discussion groups um, with the goal of raising the profile of hand, housing, land and property and associated issues. So on women's empowerment, on, um, you know, very practical, you know, we talk about the nexus, but land is obviously the kind of centre of it. And we talk about stabilisation and land is 
you know, the cause of conflict and it needs to be addressed in, in response. So this conference will be looking at those issues. It will be hosted at Howard University, who have a, a very strong, is a HBSU, so Historically Black College and University. They have a very strong uh, focus on kind of on, on ethics. So hopefully it'll be drawing into some US expertise on land as well. Um, people are welcome. It's not going to be, it's not massive, massive conference. Um, given the venue size, but we're really keen to kind of have it, have, give it a go, see how it works. And if it works, we'll do more. Um, obviously, everyone's welcome. It will be virtual pa open panel presentations, but then the rest will be in person because it's easier and more functional way of managing things. Um, I'll share more information as we get it. And anyone wants to know more, please contact me or Hilmi or Ibere directly. Thanks, uh, Joseph. This is a uh, very uh, interesting and definitely very good. We are all trying somehow to fill the the gap <laughs> left by the the World Bank land conference being absent. Uh, but definitely, uh, it will be great to hear more and see how also we can contribute. Different partners can contribute. Thanks. I see now other hands. Uh, Lorena. Thank you, Umbrella. I just wanted to ask if within the different issues that you had prioritized, you were considering uh, having a discussion on the existing software alternatives that we can use to safeguard HLP documentation. Um, this is something that we have discussed with the World Bank at some point. I know there is something called Black Chat. What's the name? Block, block change? blockchain i'm not sure yeah but i know this is one of many different alternatives uh that i don't know maybe the rest are really familiar with uh, i'm not really familiar with that and this is one of the key issues that we are discussing right now in northwest syria understanding the complexity on the land related issues however it might be one of the only opportunities that we have to at least develop a protection of documents, uh, but considering the sensitiveness of the issue, we need to guarantee that uh, the safeguard of the documents will be really, really strong. So that was one of the uh, questions that I wanted to ask if this was within any of the different uh, thematic priorities that you have identified. And also, of course, if you already know of any of these specific uh, softwares, that can or have, have been used for these purposes, if you could also share that information and include it in the uh, different webinars. That's it, thank you, over to you. Thanks, uh, Lorena. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly respond to this. Uh, no, this is not uh, among the list of priorities, but I think it could be a good um, theme, basically at the tools that are safeguarding HLP documents. Uh, I mean, yeah, the blockchain technology. Yeah, we could have uh, something on that. I have. Um, yeah, we had uh, dis many discussions ourselves as well as the inhabitant we are using in uh, for Syrian refugees property the social tenure domain model tool uh, that um, inhabitant and global alter micro developed. There are others. Um, so I'm happy to share the information about our tool with you. Uh, I'll put it in the link later, uh, but we can consider this one as well. I mean, then uh, thanks, thanks for the suggestion, and we'll uh, we'll re reconvene and and maybe share an updated list of possible themes. Um, I have Sophie first, and then Fernando second. Sophie, please go ahead. Uh, yes, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, just uh, uh, maybe I can uh, just quickly uh, introduce myself. I'm a consultant working on durable solutions and training, and I just wanted to let you know that uh, there is an online course on durable solutions for IDPs that was developed under the GP 2.0 consortium last year with a strong uh, HLP component. So I was part of the team developing it together with Barbara. McKellen, who is also in this uh, in this call and who is an HLP specialist. So for the, those who want to take it, it's available on many 
uh, websites, including uh, UNOCHAR, IOM, UNHCR, and UNDP's uh, website. Uh, well, learning platform if you have access to them or if you don't it's uh, available upon registration on disasters ready so you don't need to uh, uh, to pay anything and yeah once again it's on uh, durable solutions for IDPs and there is a, a, a strong yeah. HLP component it's a three hundred three hours course uh, which uh, uh, talks about what is uh, what, what are durable solutions, and uh, we do insist a lot on HLP and on concrete <coughs> examples also. So I just wanted to highlight that the, that is accessible, and uh, uh, that it could be uh, of use for um, or uh, a member of this group and and maybe their partners. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. This is uh, very useful to know. Uh, definitely, I'll, I haven't seen it yet, but I'll have a look as well, and then we can share it with the group. And uh, definitely, if we have a session on durable solution, include it and maybe give a space for for, for a short presentation on that. Thank you, uh, Fernando. Yeah, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Dima and Umbretta. Uh, no, I wanted to mention uh, just a comment to the work plan, and I, I see there is a strong focus on on solutions as it should be, uh, because HLP is a cornerstone for that, uh, uh, for, for solutions, but I wonder if we should also, uh, given that the HLP AOR sits within the protection cluster that is activated for emergencies, have something a bit more specific about emergencies. And of course, I think I was thinking, OK, HLP due diligence, which is Possibly, um, I mean, it's one of the first um, topics in the in the plan in your slide, on Breta, But due diligence needs to happen at any time, anyway, right? Whether it is in a solutions-oriented uh, program or in emergencies. And I wonder what is it additionally that we could do to um, build capacity of teams that are responding to emergencies. Uh, 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 fast emergencies like the earthquake we saw or Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I wonder if we need to. I don't know how. If we want, maybe we don't want more work streams. It's a cross-cutting issue, or, or how would we be able to include that? Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, I think it's a good point, particularly for. And I mean, at the end, it's also quite different when there is disaster or there is conflict. I mean, there are a lot of similarities, but there are significant differences and definitely many of our team teams struggling on the ground to to coordinate and put appropriate uh, you know um, elements of analysis in the earthquake response for example in Syria uh, I don't have an answer but I think we will keep it uh, keep thinking uh, maybe to to have something more yeah, nuanced uh, or specific for emergencies. Um, clearly, I mean, Jim, please do feel free to come in at certain point. I'll sure. give you anyway the word at the end. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know, I'll if Sophie and Lorena, you have old hands or new hands. I'll just briefly uh, comment on just in response yeah. to Fernando's point, because um, I think there's something about equipping, you know, our colleagues to respond, but I think there's also a need probably as well to look again at sort of the advocacy within the system and within our colleagues just to emphasise, you know, the role of uh, HLP programming and interventions at that kind of emergency humanitarian phase. So I think alongside the kind of practical, how do we do this also, um, you know, doing something on uh, sort of advocating for why that's important and obviously linking with the solutions and looking at those kind of the thread right the way through. But um, but yeah, something there at the, at the on the advocacy side as well. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, over to you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. And also the assessments. I mean, that's, for example, one area. I know there is a lot of assessments uh, existing. Um, and reasons why not all the aspects can always be incorporated because then they become very long and unmanageable. But this is an area, for example, where we are working on now um, in, in the earthquake response because um, the, the HLP remains a gap. Um, Lorena? Yeah, I'm sorry. It was a new hand, but it has to do with the point uh, that Go Fernando ahead. raised, which is connected with my previous uh, issue with the software. Because with the earthquake, uh, this has been one of the key issues, the loss of 
ownership of HLP related documents uh, from all of the movements that we have had after the earthquake. And we need to guarantee that there is the capacity to provide some safeguard to these documents, even though we won't be able to do anything with them right now. Uh, and this is also linked not only to the advocacy, which I believe is key, but also with funding for the first allocation that we received for the response uh, of the earthquake in northwest Syria. We had placed HLP as one of the key actions and it was rejected uh, and it was sent to the second uh, allocation, which is more uh, early recovery. And for us, again, uh, in agreement with Fernando, this is not this is not where we are going to need the capacity. We need it right now because people continue to move between IDPs, sites, uh, reception centers, collective centers, and they will probably lose the documents that they had if, if they don't didn't lose them already with the earthquake. So um, if we can add to the work plan, maybe the linkage between these specific tools to safeguard information and documentation on HLP and guarantee that our partners in the field will have the capacity to do that. I believe that will be really useful, even if we will be able to conduct a specific response on the later stages. But in the first uh, level of response, we need to have the capacity to provide some level of safeguard to these documents. Uh, over to you. Lorena, do, do you want to just um, just introduce yourself and just say where you're working? Because that's you know relevant for the for your comments. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, My name okay. is Lorena Nieto. I uh, I am the senior protection cluster coordinator for the uh, response in northwest Syria. And which organization at this point? I'm sorry, <laughs> you need to. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Thank you. And uh, yeah, point well taken and uh, fully agreed. Um, I don't think I see any more contributions. Uh, Jim, you want to add uh, from your end? I mean, I, I yeah, really welcome the comments and the engagement. I think it's really interesting, you know, when you put something out there and then you get a little bit of, uh, yeah, people see where maybe there are gaps or there are things that they would also like to see. So that's really helpful. Um, yeah, I say we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this and reflect and maybe share again something kind of in writing that people can comment and uh, come back to in sort of slow time, as it were, as well. Um, because although we have the, you know, we're always trying to look how we can better support the responses and, and our colleagues working in the different countries. But then, you know, it's good to have these kind of longer term, you know, tools and needs and things identified that we can be developing as well. So, yeah, really helpful. Thank you. And keep commenting on this if uh, if you if things come to you. But we'll we'll share a, a sort of a draft version for people to have a, uh, a chance to reflect on um, Yeah, maybe the next newsletter, which we can send out next week um, that can sort of bring some of these things together. Yeah. Yes, and then um, th thanks, Jim. And maybe on the way forward for the work plan, uh, we will put this in a shareable format. It is, but we'll share with you and then uh, start uh, basically ask to asking you and your organizations to to indicate interest or propose yourself also, because at the end we we are happy to create create a platform and a space for uh, different partners organization to report their work and suggest as well. So we are very happy for for any of you of your colleagues to take the lead uh, on this uh, different uh, streams of work. Um, with that, uh, I think uh, I, I just want to say uh, I've put I'm putting now here um, for Lorena a link to a page where uh, you can see a bit more on one of the tools we use um, for that uh, and I also take the opportunity of having the floor also to share is an AOB but a report we we launched yesterday as well um, on uh, land women empowerment and socioeconomic development in the Arab region uh, so uh, basically uh, yeah, linked to to some of the work we did, some field assessment we did in four countries and trying to correlate some of the trends of access to housing, land and property rights and, uh, you know, human development indicators somehow. Um, so with that, back to you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Ombretta. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks. Keep the, the, the comments coming. Really helpful.
Um, and yes, just noting in the chat, um, sharing uh, um, uh, yeah, reports and uh, another animation. Stuart, thank you for that. And as Joseph says, yeah, that kind of makes the point that things are still relevant and still out there. And um, on the website, we'll create a place to gather these things together. Um, and that animation that's just been shared actually is in a number of languages as well. So yeah, thanks for posting that. Um, and there's also some short mobile online training as well around HLP in emergency shelter response as well. So we can share links to that as well. But yeah, thank you for that. I just wanted to also take a, a brief moment to um, just mention the Global Protection Cluster um, Conference or forum that's happening in Amman in May um, 8th to 12th. And so initially, you know, this was sort of suggested and put out there for people who are coordinators or co-coordinators of the HLP working groups uh, and things. But we'll be having some dedicated days on um, the HLP AOR. So it's, uh, you know, it's throughout the whole week. Some of the sessions we work together with the other uh, global uh, protection cluster and AORs and, and uh, uh, the teams from different countries. But we'll have one, one and a half, two days where we'll have dedicated sessions for the HLP AOR. And I'd really like to, you know, make those days open to uh, members of the, the community here if if they are interested, either if you're in Amman or if you can get there. Um, but um, I will, um, uh, yeah, just, um, and we're sort of thinking through ideas for those days and uh, there'll be some stuff probably around information management, how we might work with local national partners, some more on securing uh, women's HLP rights, um, collaborative work, how do we work together on advocacy and other issues, and then some of the ways we might link in with other clusters and parts of uh, you know the response architecture as well um, you know how we work with for example mine action shelter cccm others what do we think about climate change and what does that that mean for us so we're, we're sort of thinking through how best to organize those days um but yeah we'd really sort of welcome you to um, consider uh, joining us and if you any questions uh, please do get in touch um i'm just going to put a link in for you know if you're interested to to register um uh, the, the conference itself, you know, we can you can come to and you'll need to cover costs around you know, travel and accommodation. But but the conference itself will be um, yeah, covered by the, the GPC. But yeah, please do do let me know if you've got any questions or comments um, and I'll um, yeah, there's uh, a link to uh, to be able to sign up through this. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to mention that and. Um, and in the. In the spirit of how we work with other clusters and colleagues working in different parts of humanitarian response and beyond, I want to hand over to uh, Melina um, and maybe Abire as well, I'm not sure, um, to um, give us an update on the work you've been doing with uh, HLP and the CCCM cluster. Um, some really good, exciting developments there. So I'm really pleased to have Melina present on that. Melina, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you. I prepared a um, short presentation for the toolkit. Uh, Jim, just so I'm mindful of time, approximately how much time um, do I have? Do you reckon you could do it in seven minutes? Yes. Yeah, definitely. OK. And if it's um, shorter, go... that's fine. OK, I'll run through it um, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I will um, go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm not seeing the option. Do you want me to share it? I can share it. Oh, from here. sorry. I got it. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Right. Yeah, we see it well. Okay. Perfect. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Melina Holder. Um, I think we've, I've been on a call with many of you before to talk about the toolkit, but I will be providing um, a brief overview and introduction and talk about next steps for the housing, land and property rights toolkit for CCCM practitioners. Um, so here's a brief agenda of the presentation. I'll go over it a little bit uh, quicker, but I was gonna give a little background. Um, the aim and audience, methodology, methodology, the structure, a uh, brief overview of the thematic areas and discuss next steps. So as many of you know, uh, this toolkit uh, came about in response to priorities identified by the CCCM and HLP practitioners to strengthen HLP responses in different types of camp settings. 
Um, it was developed in collaboration with the CCCM cluster and HLP AOR working groups, um, where we identified kind of areas where CCCM practitioners are most concerned or engaging with HLP and tenure security issues. Um, HLP tools that are relevant for CCCM practitioners and any gaps in available uh, guidance and resources. Um, so the aim of the toolkit uh, was to provide resources and tools for kind of all phases of CCCM programming, uh, beginning with project planning, such as due diligence uh, to implementation and closure, closure or transition, and for any situations that may arise along the way, such as um, any evictions, dispute resolution, kind of themes along this line. And the intended audience is kind of for CCCM practitioners who are not HLP experts um, and need easily navigable guidance that's uh, relevant and useful. So did the development of the toolkit came about um, or was informed from input from the CCCM Practitioners Day, uh, working group meetings, um, analysis of existing CCCM shelter and HLP documents, and consultations with the CCCM cluster and practitioners, as well as the HLP AOR working groups. The toolkit is structured around eight uh, main thematic areas, and as you can see, these include due diligence, community representation and participation, women's inclusion, conflict management and mediation, camp closure and transition, urban displacement, eviction response and resettlement, and inclusion of persons of dis with disabilities. And again, these themes kind of derived from our consultations and identification of gaps in resources. Um, each thematic area in the toolkit provides an overview of the topic and how it relates to CCCM and HLP. So, for example, for due diligence, kind of what parts of um, identifying property ownership or um, other due diligence processes are relevant. Uh, and then it provides a set of relevant resources and tools. So the resources are kind of longer documents like guidance notes, reports, any case studies, and then the tools are really intended to be usable items like question sets, checklists, um, templates for mapping exercises, or anything else that can be adapted to the context or situation. And then each resource and tool provides um, a context and the context indicates kind of the intended audience for the resource or tool, the physical or geographic context and any in, any other type of information that would help the reader quickly identify whether or not the resource or tool is relevant to them. And then the summary identifies where in the resource or tool there's useful information that is relevant to CCCM um, and also highlights the key messages. But rather than summarizing the content of the resource or tool, the summary is really aimed to help uh, the reader navigate the document to quickly identify the information they need and understand why it is relevant. Um, so it kind of serves more as a, as a roadmap to, to the resources that are provided. And then there's a further reading section that's included at the end of each thematic area to provide additional information that do not contain the context and summaries uh, should the engager, uh, reader wish to engage in the topic more. Um, and it's kind of intended that the toolkit will be continuously updated um, as tools become available. Uh, so to briefly kind of describe what kind of content is within each thematic area, under due diligence, there are themes covered like verifying land ownership, conducting tenure assessments, understanding roles, rights, and responsibilities as it relates to HLP and tenure security. Community representation and participation has information about HLP rights and awareness building, um, guidance on or templates for participatory mapping and enumeration exercises, and identifying stakeholders. Women's inclusion has information about gender responsive HLP tenure assessments, GBV risk mit mitigation, and um, women's HLP rights and inclusion. Conflict management and mediation has uh, guidance on engaging with land markets, tools for land and conflict prevention, and alternative conflict management and mediation information. For camp closure and transition, uh, there's information about natural resource management, transferring of use rights and collective center closure um, and tenure rights. Urban displacement has information about um, HLP and tenure security and out of camp contexts. Uh, this is kind of the main focus of this section, but also interventions for land access in cities um, and HLP and tenure security in rental assistance programs. 
And then eviction response and resettlement has tools for eviction risk mapping, um, prevention and intervention, and other guidance on CCCM eviction response strategies. And then disability inclusion focuses on um, tenure assessments for persons with disabilities and any protections or protocols uh, that should be included with regards to HLP and tenure security for persons with disabilities. So the next step with the toolkit, um, the PDF version for dissemination is available. So we're going to begin disseminating it with um, CCM Cluster and HLP AOR partners, as well as a short video that will kind of run through the toolkit and show how to use it um, and introduce it. And then um, we will be engaging in sharing the toolkit with country offices, uh, coordinating field tests, and then soon um, it will be available and published on the CCCM cluster website. Uh, so that's all I had. And if anyone has any questions or um, wants to make sure that they're on the list for dissemination, you can reach out to me at uh, melsmith.iom.int. Um, and that's all I had. Thanks, Melina. That's great. And um, yeah, if there's any yeah links or anything to share, let's make sure we put them in the newsletter or or in the the, the chat here as well. Uh, but really appreciate your your work on uh, bringing that together. Um, and really interesting to you know have that not only the guidance and drawing together tools that are already out there, but that kind of walking people through how it applies, why it's relevant, which I think is a real value add for that. So really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing it kind of used and uh, and then see how we uh, best make use of it within the, the website where it could be more kind of interactively engaged with so yeah thanks i really appreciate that um great so we have um six minutes left by my clock i'm going to park my own reflections on the trip to somalia because i would like to um hear from colleagues on the call if anyone would like to um uh, mention something they're working on or give a brief update um, I had a message before I was going to invite uh, Barbara to um, introduce herself and her new role. If Barbara, if you're if you're there, please do um, do come forward. But others, if you want to raise a hand and say something either in the chat or to colleagues, then please, uh, please do. Oh, yes, Catherine, do you want me to hand over to you first? See, I respond if I see a camera come on, I'm like, oh, hi. That's how we do. <laughs> But Catherine there or Barbara, please. thank you very much. Hi. Yeah, thank you. You can hear me, I hope. Uh, yes. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, all colleagues. Uh, Catherine from DSC. And I want, I think you're still on, Barbara, but I wanted to introduce our new great colleague that I know quite a few of you know already, Barbara Mrakan. And uh, Barbara started with us in DSC, Danish Refugee Council, uh, on Monday <laughs> only, and uh, will be the global HLP advisor for DSC. So moving forward, also Barbara will be the colleague representing uh, DSC in this forum. And we are super thrilled because we have been trying to to engage <laughs> this far, but it's been difficult for us. But now we have a dedicated resource with Barbara. And moving forward, we will be also reaching out to you bilaterally in terms of Barbara taking stock of where we are at in DSC when it comes to housing, land and property, which in DSC is part of our legal aid work and legal aid work actually being part of our protection sector. But within legal aid work, we have three competency areas and housing, land and property is one. The others are civil documentation and asylum procedure. So Barbara will be dedicated on the HLP work and uh, we're really looking forward to that and hoping also that uh, you will uh, you will be welcoming Barbara as she will also be reaching out to you to discuss ideas and also your perspectives on where DSC also as a legal aid and HLP actor can add value and can complement all the collective efforts. I don't know, Barbara, if you want to come in also. Um, Yes, just just to, for, to say a few words that I managed to switch on the camera. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, Catherine said it also. I will reach out to some of you um, um, just to understand more what your priorities are, are how we can cooperate on different issues. Um, in the first part of my job, I will also work uh, internally to DRC to test, take stock of where we are, etc. So I'll reach out, but if you also want to reach out, feel free. I've put my email address um, in the chat. Um, yes, and that's it for the moment. As Catherine said, I'm 
very new to DRC, so um, yeah, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Barbara. And uh, I think a number of us here will already know you and your work and, uh, uh, you know, have been part of the your work supporting the Special Rapporteur on the human rights of IDPs and, and things as well. So welcome to to the, the, I don't know, the community. Do we call it a family? I'm not sure. But anyway, it's very good to have you with us. And uh, um, thanks for, yeah, for being here. And look, we're, it's really great to have, um, you know, sort of dedicated HLP capacity from DRC and look forward to having you you with us. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, and would anyone else like to give a, a brief update or um, yeah, say hello or anything really? Um, any Anything that they're working on or uh, if anything new that's happening? Um, I see lots of you on there and I know you're involved in very interesting work. So please do, even just a brief comment. It's uh, always good to hear what people are people are doing. Can I, do I need to set the bar even lower than that? Uh, even just to say hello. Come on, people. I know you're there. You don't have to. Hello. Hello. Thanks. <laughs> Suppose if you ask for it, that's what you get, right? Um, fair enough. In the chat, what's someone saying? Oh, Phil's saying hello. Hi, Phil. Good. Excellent. <laughs> it's a new, it's a new low, isn't it? When uh, that's that's the inputs. No, but I like it. It's still good. Great. Okay. Well, if anything does come to mind, please do um, get in touch and. Um, Yes, and we'll be drawing to a, a close now. Um, I, I'll speak a little bit more on the the visit I, I undertook to Somalia. I'll do that next time. Um, but yeah, it was suffice to say it was very interesting and HLP issues are key. And one of the key things that comes up is that link between emergency response and durable solutions that we've we've heard about already uh, in the call and, and the need to have both of those things in mind. So um, it spoke well of our partnership in leading with the uh, UN Habitat and it also spoke well for the participation of all of you here. So. Um, yeah, look forward to discussing that more. But um, yeah, thank you. Ombretta, would you like to say anything at this point? Uh, not really, but I think uh, it was a first good meeting and uh, we look forward to have um, a more concretized uh, work plan so that we can, uh, you know, s already, uh, you know, see how some of the topics will maybe come across uh, later and then you know some of you can more concretely think where you can contribute better or where you can prepare your present your your cases your experiences there so I'm very much looking forward actually to to have this uh, down with all the super interesting topics that uh, we will be discussing in the course of the year um, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Amman Yes, that would be great. And yeah, and I think we'll probably start maybe even approaching people about some of these work areas as well. If we know you have an interest, though, that would be good to, to discuss more. But great. OK, well, that's it from my side. Um, we'll be following up with the newsletter and we'll bring together the presentations where we can and uh, the recording and, and that kind of thing as well. So, um, yeah, um, let's keep in touch. But thanks and have a good rest of the day. You too. Bye, bye. bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, bye, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.